Well, Iceland is a very unique place in the world for two main reasons. So a divergent plate boundary where plates are moving apart. You, usually these places are on the, on the ocean bottom. The few that are above sea level are in very different conditions. In, and uh, so volcanoes, they build the extra material that's necessary to keep Iceland above sea level. This is not the only hotspot, but, but it's, the, it's one of the most powerful ones on Earth. It's a very young country, geologically speaking, because yeah, it wasn't a part of Pangea. It's very like active. There was a lot of like geysers and you know thermal energy. You will see in some brochures that Icelanders are, are quite sustainable in their energy production, but that's only partly true. Most of the energy that we consume here is hydroelectricity produced by the rivers. And this requires reservoir building, and reservoirs destroy the vegetation, and so there are two sides to that. A good part of the energy budget is for heating houses, and this is done directly from drill holes. In the last few decades, uh, there is also some electricity generated by geothermal power plants. House heating is just like <laughs> warm water from the ground, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just really hot water. <laughs> we have like really unique swimming pools, like everywhere, almost every neighborhood has one, which is like ridiculous, this is like thermal bath, these are our beaches. We have here in Iceland eruptions on the average every two years or so, and most of them are fairly small and moderate. Uh, sometimes we have bigger eruptions. We have this a bit schizophrenic uh, relationship with the volcanoes, because on one side the volcanoes are, can be quite terrible, but on the other side they are the reason why Iceland is here. A nice volcanic eruption is really quite a spectacular sight. So so it's uh, the most popular public entertainment is when you want to have a good uh, eruption going on somewhere. But then, on the other hand, some of these er eruptions can be quite dangerous. And, uh, so in like in 1973, there was uh, an eruption in Heimai off, off the south coast within a town of 5,000 people. One fourth or one fifth of the town was covered by the new lava. Part of it has been rebuilt from that, but the rest of the town is built up again, as it was before. The Laki fires in 1783, and uh, as a consequence of this, there was a poisoning of the vegetation, and therefore about half the livestock was, was killed. And as a consequence of that, about one-fifth of the population of Iceland perished in a famine. For most of the volcanoes, we have a few hours or maybe a few days warning before it actually breaks out. But exactly when that will be is more difficult. So I have difficulties with next week, but I'm pretty sure about the day to day. And we have about 60 or 70 percent success rate in issuing warnings before the eruption actually breaks out. So a very dense earthquake swarm in one of these volcanoes, would, that would be the alarm. All the biological activity you see is very recent. Because uh, Iceland also is a land of glaciers, and uh, the glacial period was very harsh here, and uh, the whole country was covered by a glacier until about 12,000 years ago. Uh, we are still in a very transient state with vegetation and animal life. Global warming causes the glaciers to melt, and the glaciers put a, a weight on the crust. When the, the glaciers become lighter, the crust will rise. The center of Iceland rises about two, three centimeters per year because of global warming. If you dig into the soil, you can you find this layer, which is very 
particular. And just at that time, that uh, this marks in the soil, that's when people moved to Iceland and started farming. It was very harsh and difficult and dark to live in this country for so many ages. And how all that reflects in the sagas. I usually focus on like fairy tales because I think that they show more into the soul of the people. People are expressing their dreams through fairy tales. But as for the legends, that's more about how daily life was in the old peasant community in Iceland. Maybe some Icelander were traveling abroad and he brought a new story with him to Iceland. And the story is much like a seed of flower or whatever that comes with the wind. For this seed to become a plant, you need a certain kind of soil. And it's exactly the same with the stories. If the story doesn't appeal to the community, then it just dies out and it won't be told again. And for stories to circulate for centuries, they really must have something to say to the people that conserves them and keeps on telling them. Then you can read into the dreams and hopes of people and how they felt and how their struggles were. Iceland is uh, in many ways different to the neighboring countries. It is isolated, but not only the country, but also the farms, they were also isolated. You had villages of 30, 40 houses and something like that. And when there were dense gatherings, in some of the bigger farms, there were much excitement. So the authorities, they tried to ban this. But also the church tried to ban this because they thought that it was just uncivilized. When people in Iceland stopped dancing, probably in the 18th century, they kept on telling about the dancing in, in legends. We have a great many legends about hidden people. And the hidden people, they live in mounds or cliffs or stones or rocks or whatever. And the idea of the hidden people dancing all the time is a reflection of what Icelanders used to do. If you suppress a culture, it always finds a way. So people express, instead of dancing, they express the ideas and the memories of dancing through that tales. In the 14th century, people began to turn these sagas into verse and to chant them. So if you took one saga of an Icelander or one medieval saga and chanted it in the long evenings, it could probably take many, many evenings to finish one saga. The medieval sagas, they lived on in the Rimer form throughout all the centuries. In the manuscript tradition, they were constantly rewritten and in every single century there were people writing the old stories and they always wrote the stories for the new generation. So they always changed it a bit. So you can follow the medieval literature all the way to the modern times by looking at the manuscript tradition and also how the material merged into other forms like into the Rimer form the same occurrences in Iceland tales is that everything bad turns out right. Every bad person is a good person. It always ends with, you know, the enchantment is broken. The spring will come. In April, everybody is talking about, well, no, no, it is, no, it is coming, you know, the spring is coming. And then you begin to smell in May when people take out their barbecues and so on. And it's still cold when people just wear t-shirts. I mean, we, we can't sunbathe until maybe July. June is okay. It's a bright month. You can see it in today's society that people are eagerly waiting for the spring every year. Well, John T. Stanley, he said, I pitied the poor Icelanders who could not, like swallows, gather themselves together for the flight to climates less hostile to the comforts of the human existence. 
What the Icelanders can enjoy deserving the name of happiness during her long winter, I cannot imagine. They could meet and talk and laugh in the open air, and it mattered little that their houses were dark and stifling and comfortless, but the winter's life in such dens I cannot figure to myself as better than a mere endurance of life, and that unless it could be slept through without waking. So he sees the Icelandic winter as an endurance test. And as he said, they, they, they could meet and laugh and talk, and he, he found it difficult to, to understand how they could and why they wouldn't, you know, just fly away if they could fly away. The people that used to live here, they had to go long ways to get food. They used the ocean, of course, for fishing, and then the cliffs at Lautrabjarg for gathering eggs and hunting birds. Here you can get those conditions that you get blinded by snow or, or, or fog, and then you uh, don't realize until you have the boat crashing into the cliffs. The archaeology in Iceland is very interesting because the ruins are so whole when you find them. Archaeological remains are, are so visible, preserved underneath other houses, so people built another house on top. When I talked about the 12th, 13th and the 14th centuries, when we had the most literary activity, Iceland was not isolated. We had uh, rich chieftains who had ships and so on, and there were many people, or, or the richer people at least, they traveled a lot between Iceland and the continent, and especially between Iceland and Scandinavia. In general, I would say that Iceland has been open and to some extent sucked up international influences, and that traces centuries back. And like Iceland in the medieval centuries, there was a lot of import of knowledge from Europe and people stressed the need of having foreign knowledge in Iceland. The society has changed a lot in short time. The Icelandic people today, they are really divided into two. Many people like to keep the specialties of Icelanders and see that we are so few, we can so easily lose our language. And if we lose our language, we don't understand our literature anymore. We can read literature from the 13th century and we understand it because the language has changed very slowly. And it would be very harmful for us as a nation to lose the connection that we have to our culture throughout the ages. For the future of the country, it's more a question of how to retain the language than you know, what the composition of the people is, I think. And, and that's a real defensive battle. You know, how do you keep a language that 300,000 people now understand and write on? In the world of constant emails and Netflixes and whatnot, then it's hard to retain that identity. Especially in the 20th century, there was an emphasis on translating everything, translating common words that is used all over the world, like English words, like for computers or stuff. If we would lose our language, we would lose the threat that tells us who we are and from where we came and so on. And we try to preserve not only the language, we try to preserve the naming system. My name is Adalheiður Guðmundur Dóttir, just means the daughter of Guðmundur, who is my father. And that's the old German naming system. My father is Gunnar. So I'm Jakob Gunnarsson, which is just like Gunnar, Gunnarsson. There aren't really like last family names in Iceland. I think the idea was to have a society that doesn't have stuff like that. Family names that carry a lot of weight and open doors and stuff. If you have a surname, people will notice you. So it's always what you want for the community and what you want for yourself. It doesn't always go together. 
we also want to be a part of the world. And we don't want to be isolated. And I think as an islander, people appreciate the connection. Because you look differently at the world when you're on an island than when you are on a mainland. Access has always been important for Iceland. And one of the key reasons that we have tourism in Iceland is the system that Iceland Air introduced to Iceland to have Iceland as a hub between North America and Europe. So that's why we have so many international flights now. Access is everything in terms of tourism. So that's one of the reasons that we have this huge tourism development in Iceland. You want to be international and you want to welcome everybody to the island and you want to allow people to move into the country and so on. And then on the other side, you want to preserve everything that you have and you know that you can't preserve everything that is Icelandic if you allow every foreign influence to come into the country. You want to be broad-minded and also want to preserve what is Icelandic. So when you talk about that, some people might call you, do you think that uh, Icelandic culture is better than other cultures or whatever? So, so I sometimes think how the discussion is going on, it's not on the right track because we should be able to be very proud of what we have. But we know that all the countries around us, they also have traditions and culture that they can be proud of. And we are not saying that we are better than nobody else. It's just what is us, what we have, is what we want to keep. Icelanders are very much aware of the fact that you are not better than anybody else. But I think there was this idea that we were kind of superior in some way because we have strong genes and so on. But the modern Icelander is rather ashamed when somebody claims that he is more like uh, the Vikings and so on. So that's not the discussion that we have you know, today, but it was. We've always been like, yeah, we have so many good, we're so good in this, even though we're this small. Per capita, we're always so good in everything. That's like an Icelandic thing to say. Per capita, we're like the best football team in the world, the best blah, blah. And per capita, we're the best jazz nation in the world. But like, even though it's kind of an Icelandic cliche, it's kind of true because we're only 300,000, which is like a tiny thing. It's a mix and match society. So like, if you don't if you don't agree with something that some people are saying, just go somewhere else. Like, there's probably someone out there who's, who agrees with you. Oh, in, here in Iceland, nobody's gonna stop you from believing in what you want. You just believe in what you want. I believe in God. I don't. He believes, he believes in, in science. Ex- I believe in exactly nothing. Not even science? I believe in science, but uh-huh. that's, that's not like a god. Thing. I mean, other people are Jews. I mean, there's nobody stopping you. It's not like um, it's not like India. Any... So there's nobody stopping you in India. I yeah, it's just you can't be a Christian in India. India. Who told you that? Movies. Yeah, movies are never right. You can't exactly. buy much with one dollar, but you can buy really much stuff with like hundred kroner here. I mean, this I is guess a small island. I mean, everybody has the, money I think here. The, There's no I, like I think, homeless people. I think the so I think yeah. the price, like the price inflation of those big things, that's due to the isolation because it's harder to ship them from different countries. Uh, the re- reason that I think Iceland is rather boring compared to other countries is that. They don't have as many like attractions and like things to do because I'm one of those people that once you see something, I've seen it, I can remember that. We I went once to the birthplace of my grandpa. That place is famous for many mountains there, but it's really boring. I mean, the only thing there are mountains. Done. My favorite thing to do is just go to the backyard and look for like really cool bugs. You can go anywhere like because there's a lot more freedom here and 
Yeah, this is the basically safest uh, it's the most peace in the world to be. Lamps everywhere. In whole restaurants, whole hotels, you can eat uh, local, fresh, naturally grow lamps. It's not just uh, because of meat, you know. They also uh, making uh, sweaters and a lot of things. Icelandic sheep are done in such a weird way, you know. They let them out into the highlands and then, you know, let them just stay there for the summer. And then they go and get them all, you know, and then they, you know, kill them and sell them. Icelanders have always been really proud of their meat and like their dairy and everything and also you know it's a political thing as well because farmers have always have very strong representatives in Congress. You can't bring raw meat here if you sell an Icelandic horse to another country you can't ever bring it back it, like it, it's impossible. And if, if you're gonna bring a dog here, it has to be in quarantine for like weeks. The animals there have become like unique in, in some ways. Be, for example, like the Icelandic horse has like a type of walk that very few other species of horses have, which is called tult and it's like a softer trot and, and like it's, it's, it just feels amazing. It makes the Icelandic horse very unique. We're in the middle of the Atlantic, so things have to blow here or fly here or swim. So and we are studying fishes that sort of colonize waters just after the ice retreated. They move in and then they find their niches and are evolving into different niches uh, along the coast and in the highlands also. All my life I grew up on a farm, I was a cowboy until I was maybe 16. Then I went away from the farm and went to become a fisherman. It was a very tough experience to begin with. I was 16 years old and we were working 18 hours plus. So, and that had been uh, my main occupation until recently. My body gave in. It was very good when I started, and until recently, where the big companies are getting all the quotas. They are sucking up all the quotas from the smaller guys, and it's always maybe a few years there will be only five or six companies that have all the fishing quota in Iceland. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but that's it. The cages are always breaking, not always, but it happens, and maybe a thousand fishes go out. I think they will ruin the Icelandic salmon, our salmon, you know. They will genetically blend. Decode has been here for 20 years, approximately, a little bit over. And um, in the beginning, they set out to map disease genes. So their premise was that Iceland was somehow extremely qualified through, I guess, low immigration mainly. But also they stated that they had low genetic diversity compared to the European population. That was not exactly true. <laughs> it's, it's true if you look at one measure of population diversity, but it's not if you look at other measures. So you have the same mutation segregating in Iceland as you have in Europe, but you just have fewer combinations of them. So fewer types of different chromosomes for a given region. That's actually like a universal human story. So the same mutations are across the globe. If Iceland was too genetically unique, then the results here would not be applicable abroad. But it turns out they are quite applicable. So Iceland is good that you have a good genealogy and you have good uh, sort of healthcare records, but it's small and it's actually limitingly small 
for human genetics. So Iceland was good as a starting point, but the, in the modern age you need bigger populations. Icelandic nature is fragile. That's a very well-known fact. And we can see visible erosion because of tourist numbers and things like that. So it kind of goes without saying that that means that we have to manage tourism in a more strict way. We have to have zoning roles and more strict entrance in some places and monitor numbers. But uh, culture is as important. Tourism is not only a business, it's also about cultural exchange. So tourism can mean a change in local culture, I mean both in a very positive and also negative way. The role of the Tourism Research Centre is basically to engage in all kinds of tourism research in Iceland and also to emphasise the need of research. One of the things that has been a little bit of a drawback for the tourism development in Iceland is the fact that we have not allocated enough money on research. So things have happened quite a bit, but we have not been able to follow up in relation to data gathering and this knowledge. There has been an immense increase in tourism visitor numbers to Iceland, so the last few years we have had more than 30% increase in terms of arrivals. There is a huge growth in number of tourism companies. It's not healthy to have growth like this. It's not sustainable. Because of the growth, we need foreign workforce. That means that we have a lot of people coming in who are not settling. They are not part of the community. They are only here for work and then they leave. And they also, they are working in restaurants and hotels and they are not able to communicate in Icelandic. Which can be disturbing for an older Icelandic person goes to a coffee and tries to order in Icelandic and is not able to communicate in his or her own language. So the transport of people around has enabled a lot of Icelanders to go to Europe to work, but also a lot of people coming from Europe to work here, so the demographic has been changing a lot. After working a few months in Lithuania, I met uh, my girlfriend and we thought uh, moving here. After arriving here in Keflavik, Reykjavik, we hitchhiked uh, to Akureyri in five hours. It's like 600 kilometers, so it was a very nice beginning. To meet a lot of locals and, you know, to meet uh, also Lithuanians. When I'm working in cold station, I'm coming 11 a.m. And the first thing that I have to do, make bread. And just uh, using very hot water, you mixing uh, soft dough, putting in special buckets and driving it uh, to these like uh, underground bakeries. Covered steam and it have to bake for 24 hours. Maybe someday I'm gonna move in Reykjavik because it's quite hard to live in the village. We don't have a bus every day, like a few times per week. It's very important that we are not uh, utilizing young foreign people who come and work. They need to have good work conditions and uh, there needs to be management on that front as well. So it is this need to have a proper overview and proper insight in how we want tourism to develop and also try to not only respond to difficulties but be more proactive. So what we have maybe been doing too much is just responding instead of trying to plan ahead and control what kind of tourism we want.
big city guys, you don't see so much of the skies. You don't see aurora in America, maybe in Canada, northern Canada. So I can understand why people are flocking here to just to see that. You know, when they see the flickering over the sky, they start crying and just shaking. And I don't understand it because I've seen it all my life, you know. So, well, I can understand it.